stickiness of learning, how to ensure your learning strategy makes an impact. My name is Mary Appleton and I'm Change Board's editor. We're delighted to be joined here today by Mark Edwards, who is the Programme Director of London Business School's Leadership and Strategy Programme. He's going to talk about the role of learning as a concept and how this has changed and how you can embed effective learning in your organisation and what you can do to ensure that learning sticks. He'll be sharing some examples of organisations and brands that have tailored their messaging to do exactly that and have achieved success in a short, medium and long term. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a few guidelines. Throughout the webinar, if you'd like to pose a question or a comment to Mark, Please enter this in the box on the right-hand side of your screen and click Send. There's an image on the slide now showing on your screen which shows you how to do this. We'll be taking questions after the presentation, so please feel free to pose your question at any time and we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end. We'll also be running a live Twitter feed throughout the webinar, so be sure to credit your tweet to the hashtag CBLearning. That's hashtag C be learning. We'll also be recording the webinar, so we'll send you a link to the full recording in the next few days. In a moment, I'll hand over to Mark. Mark has over 15 years' experience of developing impactful talent initiatives for international organizations across a wide range of sectors. He developed strategies that target business growth, leadership effectiveness, culture change, and talent engagement. Over to you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Mary, and uh, hello, everybody, as I uh, just get ready here. So uh, I just want to thank everybody who's joined the, uh, today's webinar. I know we've got a number of people here from the world of learning development, um, HR, organizational development, and I think in general, it's a very senior uh, level audience, so I really want to thank you for, uh, for joining today. Uh, there'll be a number of you who know me, who perhaps know London Business School, uh, and are friendly with uh, Change Board. And I think for some of you, some of this will be a recap, and for others will be fresh information. Uh, but either way, however experienced or inexperienced you are, I really hope and expect there'll be some really key nuggets you can take away and use straight away from this. Um, towards the, uh, throughout the presentation, I'll be sharing back some of the uh, data you helpfully sent in when you're registering for this uh, webinar. And towards the end, I'm going to ask you some uh, pretty meaty questions that I hope will help make some of the points that are important for today. So, with no uh, further ado, let's begin. Um, so, stickiness of learning hypothesis. Um, the role of learning has changed irrevocably, irro and we need to respond in a way that's appropriate for our context and meaning for our people. So one of the things I've avoided really uh, doing today is just looking through some really cute techniques. I think it's really important that we do understand the context of the world today, the context of business, um, and where people are at and what they're looking for. And it's within that context that we're really trying to make learning memorable, engaging, gooey, and sticky. So. Today's questions, and this is just gives you an idea of what we're going to run through today. First of all, we're going to be talking off, talking about that business context. What is happening in the world of work today? What's the, the broad business context? And uh, what's happening around brand and me, in the Facebook generation? Um, after that, we're going to be looking at, well, okay, if that's the case, if that's what's happening in the world of work, that's what's happening demographically with people, um, what are some of the shifting requirements of learning? How do we need to respond? Um, and finally, we're looking at skills which you can use straight away to make your learning more memorable uh, and sticky. So one thing that's, uh, that we know for certain is we live in a really VUCA world. We live in a world that's volatile and certain, complex, and really, really uh, ambiguous. Um, and a couple of Months ago, I had the privilege to attend the Global Leadership Summit. This is a summit that's organised, sponsored by London Business School, but um, has it get, as its guests uh, speakers from around the world who are basically industry uh, industry figures, people who are heading up their companies in the world of publishing, entertainment, uh, and all over the place. 
And uh, one of the conclusions they really shared throughout, that kept coming up time and time again, is that to some extent strategy is dead, or at least the ability to really look ahead to the next 10 years, or 15 years, or probably even five years or two years. Things are changing so exponentially and so quickly that actually being able to predict the next two, three, four, five years is really, really difficult. And therefore, the key bits of advice and the key sharing that they said they were doing in their organizations is they were trying things out and they were iterating. So they were trying things out and they were iterating. And basically, they were learning by doing. Um, that therefore places a, a, a tremendous pressure in terms of the learning practitioner today to be able to facilitate and work within that kind of world and context. How can we help other people to really learn from their experiments that they're making as we go? The other thing that was shared is really that social media and collaboration is only going to go faster and faster and faster. So there's a lovely uh, story by one of the heads of BT, and he shared they were, they were making a really key strategic decision uh, over what uh, new markets to enter into. And, um, and they shared the story that at the call center in Newcastle, which I think was sports mad, a number of people were really asking for football, they really wanted to get into sports particularly football, and uh, he said it gave him so much pleasure one day when he came back to that call center, announced that they'd done it. They'd made uh, the new transition into a new market, which was, BT, which was BT Sport. And he said that would never have happened if he hadn't really regarding his staff uh, as part of the marketing piece. So actually being able to engage with, learn from, and inform, be informed by staff is, is only going to get faster and quicker. And the other thing that was really shared, which I really pick up on, is that the really the, we're really moving from a world where the shallow, shallow generalist is powerful to the world of the serial master. You know, by 2050, 50% 50 of all jobs in the USA will be outsourced. That's an incredible statistic. So, you know, the whole makeup of the workforce is really, really changing. Uh, as, as work becomes more specialist, people are really going to have to become master craftsmen. And this has really big implications. People are really going to have to find their niche. And they're really going to have to find their core purpose and what, they're really, what their key strengths are. And I'd really argue that, that our role as learning practitioners can play a really important role in that. So the implications of all this, learning, the world of work is, is changing irrevocably. And learning practitioners, we, it's more about asking the right questions, responding quickly, and encouraging people to find their niche and their core area of strength and mastery. Allies to that, the changing business environment, is really what's happening with our people. And as we look towards Gen Y, Gen X, they're increasingly saying in all our studies, many of which we've conducted ourselves, they're saying these things, look, just give me full responsibility for a project. Um, just let me know broadly what the task is, and I'll go, I'll go and figure it out. Um, look, give me something that has value. So this generation is really looking increasingly for work that has a real uh, core purpose behind it. And I like the fact that my boss can give me a project, and I can just go away uh, and handle it. So the previous slide was really saying it's really uh, important to be able to slide and morph and create a sense of mastery in something um, and try new things out. Uh, and what we're saying here is actually this is what our people want anyway. This generation is really looking for to have a core strength, a core sense of purpose uh, in their work, and to do it fast and, and to iterate. So what was really interesting is uh, during the sign-up process for this webinar, we posed to you a question, and we really were seeking what's your purpose when it comes to learning. And uh, the question we asked is, when you think about the last time you were compelled to learn, what was your motive? Was it A, personal, that the learning signifies broadening your own horizons and enhancing your skill set? Or was it business, which is the fact that the learning helped you to great, make a great impact at work? Uh, and I just didn't know which way this was going to go, but the results were quite interesting. Um, so 65% of you responded, almost two-thirds, that actually the main reason why you sign up for learning, the main reason you're incentivized to learn, is personal. In some way, the learning is going to help shape you and talk to your calling, your purpose. Uh, and, and you know something that's really interesting. I've, I've got such a privilege in, in the work that I'm doing at the moment to really uh, be part of, contribute, sit in on a number of lectures, a number of programs 
that's taking place across the leadership uh, portfolio, strategy portfolio, marketing portfolio at London Business School. And you know, if I just listen to the types of questions, if I follow the interest in the room, people ask questions such as, you know, even when they're looking at strategy and marketing, well, what would this mean for me? What can be my contribution in developing this marketing strategy? How can I, to be honest with you, make myself look good? Uh, how can I really convey my arguments really eloquently? And how do I position myself? But it's, a lot of it is really on the me. And I think that's really important. That's a really interesting observation. Because I think we need to be really mindful of that and really be, just for our own data ourselves, be aware that most people are always looking at, at the me and the we and the I. So basically, if we look at this quote here, the essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions. And it is about emotion and it is about action. And if I can just move a little bit into the world of marketing here, I want to share this story very briefly of Michelin. Uh, Michelin here in the UK produce tires. They produce a number of things, but one of the things they do is produce tires. And uh, on their forecourt, the point of purchase, they were trying to sell more tires. And they came up with slogans like this that uh, really talked about the qualities and the benefits and features of, of the tires. And they weren't doing very well. And they changed it, and they put a baby next to the tire. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. You know, and this is one of the most successful campaigns ever, you know, in automotive industry, at least here in the UK. Sales went up to like 70%, and this campaign continued for about 10 years. And the reason is, is because it spoke to me, or you, and your purpose, and your personal why. And it's also says something else, when we talk about purpose, when we talk about behavior change, it's really important to be very, very specific. So, you know, this is basically saying, look, in order to save lives, in order to save your baby's life, just buy this tire. And it's a really nice uh, example. Uh, and also, if you think about, you know, sometimes we, we're a bit loose in our terminology, so we may say, as learning publications, we want people to meet, could be more collaborative. Well, what does being more collaborative really mean? So, really focusing on the specifics is important. Right, why am I showing you a picture of Bette Midler? So, Bette Midler, for those of you who don't, no, he's a very famous American star. Uh, he's a famous singer, and she, in the film Beaches, came out with this fantastic quote. Uh, but enough about me, let's talk about you. What do you think about me? I mean, really, uh, it's a nice example, and uh, there's so much literature around at the moment that basically is saying that we've become, or we're becoming self-centered, selfish, self-interested, uh, and self-seeking. And I'd argue that this is wonderful, because the gateway into learning uh, and into learning what will be relevant in terms of how we put information across. And it has implications. It really asks us the question, how can we frame learning for the individual and their own needs? And how can we really provide a very strong personal why? You know, and there may be some of you sitting in on this webinar agreeing, and there may be some of you disagreeing. There may be some of you disagreeing, saying, well, actually, you know, the sense of purpose and contribution has never been greater than this today. And I'd agree, and I'd also say that it is coming from a personal position. How can I, how can I add value? How can I contribute from having a sense of purpose? But either way, we're being challenged as learning practitioners to really make learning much deeper for the individual, more personal, uh, and more memorable. So that means that when we are, we're having to help people do dual processing, and we're helping people learning about, learn about organizational change. We're not only talking about the business context, the team context. We really, really need to focus on the individual context. So what does this mean? We talked about the business context. We talked about the changing demography. We talked about the, the need generation. This has implications in terms of uh, what we need to be uh, helping people learn about and how we need to be doing it. In terms of the what, it is things like, I don't think this will come as a surprise to, to many of you here at all on this uh, webinar, it's things like collaborative working, it's things like learning how to be more adaptable, it's learning how to embrace uncertainty, and how do I become more agile. But what I'd, I'd argue is that the more we need to specialize, the more we have to help people to find their own strengths. What is it that makes them particularly unique? And how can we get more value from them in helping them play, play to their strengths? 
How can we help others find their strengths and find their specialisms? And in terms of the how, it's, it's, you know, purpose and meaning is so important today. But also the learning, you know, you talk about the, 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 the pace of change, and this uh, demography, it has to be experiential. It has to be so much questioning. It has to be social networks because the expertise so often is in the crowd. The BT example shows that. And it has to be discovery and non-linear based. So the learner can really follow non-sequential groups and can follow what's interesting for him or her. What am I interested in and what do I, where do I need to go? So what does all that mean? What does all that mean in terms of the shifting requirements of learning? And I think in order for us to answer that, we need to really take a bit of a historical perspective and look at where I feel we are in the world of learning today. So, you know, if we look back to sort of the 1960s, 70s, even 80s, um, you had a pedagogical approach to learning. Um, and learning really was uh, teacher driven. So they were con the teacher was considered the, the expert, and the participants in the room ordinarily were really were really the passive bystanders. Uh, most of the learning was cognitive; it was theoretical. It spoke to people's minds, um, and it was safe because it didn't involve challenge. Didn't and, and basically, I don't think the teacher would have welcomed much challenge. And it was very much content driven, and uh, the idea was that, that I would be the expert and, and you would be the passive listener. And what we're clearly seeing that as um, organizations uh, are changing, as we are online and offline beginning to shape our own futures much, much more, then we're also being required and asked to do that for our learning. So what's really what emerged uh, in the last uh, couple of decades was an andragogical approach to, to learning. And this is really had the participants sitting squarely as the co-owners of the learning. So this is where, okay, the, the, the teacher or, or, or the instructor might provide a framework, but equally as important, the participants help to co-own and co-lead, you know, shape the learning. Uh, and this is where learning began to become much more transformational. Uh, it was facilitative learning, and it became really experiential and immersive. It wasn't just confined to the classroom. And it also involved uh, reflection, since we were talking about emotions and transformation. It allows and encourages people time to stop and reflect and think about how I was going to apply this learning in, in my world. And I'd argue really where we're at now is, is on the final stage with a futurological approach to, towards learning. And this is where learning is much more, much more self-directed. And this is where I'm talking about learn, learners actually taking charge uh, of their own learning. Um, so this is where learning is, is a bit, almost a bit messy really, it's, it, it's disruptive, it, it, it could change belief systems, it, it's non-linear, and, and it actually improves the learning skill uh, itself of the learners. And as we go through this, I'd encourage you to share ideas to Mary in terms of what's worked for you, where you are in the continuum, and to also be thinking about questions that we can look at at, at the end. And when we talk about discovery learning, I just think this quote is, is, is actually fantastic. It was, it was delivered by a gentleman called George Goddard, who's one of the professors at London Business School. But, but his definition of this final stage of learning is really as follows. Discovery learning is founded on the notion that adults learn most when their expectations are confounded, when their assumptions are challenged, or when they feel compelled to interrogate their own belief system. Discovery learning employs a catalytic element of surprise or disorientation. Um, and there's, there's loads and loads of, uh, of data and research at the moment, and neuroscience, etc., that actually real learning really occurs when uh, there are aha moments, where new sign-ups can be made, and new uh, ideas can be formed but that has to be created when the learner is really surprised. So to slightly surprise or disorientate the learner is scary because the learner loses some elements of control, but it can be incredibly impactful. And I just want to share one example of this um, that we worked on recently. Um, and this has really happened on, during one of our programs um, where we worked with an inner 
London College. Um, quite a diff difficult place, a place that's part, uh, you know, dealing with uh, challenges of its own, and they had their learning object, their own learning objectives from this. And we brought together some very, very senior leaders uh, together with these uh, with these children. And um, the purpose was really to redefine what leadership meant, because these leaders had been in this world for so long where they'd been number one, and clearly had a set of, of beliefs and assumptions in terms of what leadership was. And obviously these kids, these children, have a completely different uh, set of uh, experiences and expectations. And um, what actually happened with it is some joint improvisation together, and this is very carefully set up and very uh, permissions very carefully sought. Um, and afterwards they just came to a, a definition together that really worked. And the, the leaders really, for, you know, that the were involved in them, the business school, just said their, their expectations, their assumptions of what leadership went were just completely changed. And this has had a profound impact on some people. One person in particular, uh, he's really a branding expert, and he's uh, gone back to the same organization to, on two or three occasions. And he's helped this um, in a London college really work on their own branding um, free of charge. It, it really, really spoke to him and, and his sense of purpose and what, what he feels is important uh, as a leader today. So that's, I think, where we are. That's, that's where I think we are in terms of the scale. These are the business challenges. That's what's happening in terms of people. And I think we're moving towards a more discovery type of approach. Uh, that's not to say clearly that you know, we just advocate that. Of course, we do a lot of classroom uh, work. I do it, and the business school does it. Um, but it's just a shift that I see emerging, a shift towards the right-hand side of that scale, a shift towards discovery-based learning. And um, what I want to do now in the final part of this webinar before we open up to questions is really uh, share with you some really nice techniques that I see emerging a lot, uh, being used a lot uh, across industry to help make learning really, really sticky. Um, so the first one, and we've already really spoken about this, but this is really playing for personal purpose, using emotion uh, to help generate fresh uh, insights and beliefs. I think that's really important, and uh, we've spoken about it, and we'll, we will still speak a little bit more about it. I really believe asking great questions is going to become more and more important as we cease to know the answer to where the heck we're, we're going to end up in terms of today's VUCA world. The ability, the skill, and the craft to ask really great and insightful questions will become more and more important. And um, we have to, more more often, provide a clear learning journey and a strong narrative uh, for people. Um, the role of social collaboration and experimentation will, will only increase. Um, and as we move towards this real strong emphasis of, of really helping people to become masters, then actually I strongly argue the, the main way in which they can do that is to really understand where the market is going, understand what their niche can be. And, and meet that niche by playing to their own strengths. We'll be talking a little bit more about playing to strengths uh, in a short while. Uh, other aspects that I think are really important, I don't think we've got time to cover, but you maybe will be able to touch on it in the questions, uh, co-creation, making it real, and learning to unlearn, which also I think are, are really, really important to making learning sticky. So, um, asking great questions. I want to I share an example of a company I worked with recently um, who went through a large, large change. This company had around 120,000 uh, employees, and they were based all around the world. And it was a publishing education uh, company, and they were planning on really changing their strategy and moving to new markets. And as a partial consequence of this, uh, we're looking to bring two parts of the organization together essentially USA and the rest of the world. And um, this was a big, big deal. You know, people were thinking, well, what would this mean for me? Will I still have a job? How is this going to uh, affect the relationship I have with my customers, etc." And the CEO was, was really smart. You know, after he uh, posted some uh, very short video clips of um, allaying people's concern, he asked a question on the company's intranet, and he basically asked, what questions do people have regarding the integration strategy with the USA? Now, maybe I have too much time on my hands, I'm not quite sure, but I actually counted the number of responses. There was something like 312. There was, there was over 300 responses, which I thought was incredible. The amount of traffic that question generated was, was, was insane. 
Um, and what happened was people began to answer the questions for themselves. The actual CEO didn't really appear so much more on the questions, on the responses. And what also started to happen was that people would pose more questions and other people tried to answer the questions. And these were people from all up and down the organization um, who responded. They weren't limited to, to their position. To me, the quality and the quantity of these responses told me, told me something really, really important. Um, informal channels in this organization are really encouraged. Questioning is encouraged. But the, also, there's an expectation on, 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 on people as employees that they better have a smart question or an answer. Um, there's kind of an expectation behind that question that people need to be having an opinion in this organization. Because this is really just the start of uh, that CEO questioning his people in that kind of a way. Another example that I saw the, the same Global Leadership Summit um, was really by uh, Tom Hume. Um, Tom's the founder of uh, Open IDEO. And this is all an organization that asks really big questions for society. Um, so it's all voluntary. People sign up to it, and he poses these questions. And uh, what's amazing is that the questions just generate incredible responses. And one of the first questions he shared that he shared was how can we improve women's security, especially with, uh, within the slums in India? And uh, a really powerful question. Um, there was some context set in terms of the question when he posed it. But actually, what, 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 what happened was people went off, they did their own research. Obviously, many of the people that his, his target audience didn't know anything about women's security in slums in India. But it generated interest, it generated in, intrigue. And what's really, really powerful about this organization, Open IDEO, which has grown, it's grown and grown. Um, and it's it come up, it's it actually arrived at real tangible impact. It, it, um, one of, an app was developed for Amnesty International that, that, that helped save lives. There's countless other incredible inventions that, that come from it. And what's amazing is it's just people giving their time for free to answer really difficult questions. So, you know, but he, the one of the things that, things that he shared is that the amount of effort that has to be put into the question is absolutely incredible. There has to be a really clear process for how how you're going to deal with the traffic that comes back from having uh, asked the question. Uh, and you really need to think about why. You're asking the question, but why would contri people contribute to this? So why would people contribute to the integration question? Why would people contribute to the women's uh, slum security question? And as you think through this, you can probably think about questions that are really bad. We're all probably part of social networks where we hear horrendous questions, questions that are just there that are irrelevant, that are self-promoting, that are self-serving, and we ignore them. So the ability to craft a really great question, and this is the role that we can play and you can play as, as really heads of learning, is so important and so vital, I'd argue. The great questions, they create shared meaning, foster collaboration, they help us to create diverse solutions, and they really enable us to be intellectually uh, curious and be culturally inclusive. Now, uh, one of the things I feel I have to share with you well, is that uh, I officially am a criminal uh, and I did something highly illegal uh, just a few months ago uh, and I want to share that with you uh, and hopefully you'll be nice and supportive as I do this. So um, I was, uh, I'm from Liverpool, I was up north and uh, I was speeding. I, uh, I did speeding about 35 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour road uh, around Liverpool. And I got this letter through the post. And it basically said, Dear Mr. Edwards, uh, you've been caught speeding. You've got three options. Um, option one is you go on a speed awareness course. Option two is you, uh, you accept a fixed uh, penalty. Or option three is uh, you go to court uh, and, and have a court hearing. So um, obviously, I, I didn't really want to go for options two and three. But option one was uh, filling me with dread as I thought about you know, a bunch of middle-aged people listening to a guy in the front of the room, uh, probably patronizing me with a do, do's and don'ts in terms of road safety. But actually, what, what, what did happen was really, really interesting. Um, and I think whoever designed this did a great job. This is the worksheet that I was, that I was given. And, uh, and as I go through this, the reason why I'm illustrating this example 
is they, they did craft a really good learning journey in this instance, and they did pro provide a really strong narrative. So we had this worksheet, we worked through it, um, and we had to guess the mapping uh, speed miles per hour on, on different types of roads and, and fewer information. The actual maximum speed you can do on urban roads is 30 miles an hour in the UK. And uh, we were told a few facts. The first fact that we were told was uh, within the United Kingdom, 71% of all collisions take place in urban roads with people exceeding 30 miles an hour. Quite interesting. The second fact was that the pedestrian survival rate uh, really shot sharply fall between 30 miles an hour and 35 miles an hour. So if you just increase your speed by 5 miles an hour and hit somebody, there's a 30% greater likelihood that that person will die. Another interesting fact. And uh, Finally, what happened was we were given a mother's testimonial of um, her loss because her um, son had been killed by somebody exceeding 30 miles an hour, I think it was 34, 35 miles an hour, uh, on a 30 mile an hour road. So I don't know about you, but this really spoke to my sense of purpose. This really did hit me in the gut. Uh, I've got the information cognitively. Uh, and I've got it intellectually, but I've really got it viscerous, viscerously. I've got it emotionally. Um, and I think this is what we need to be doing more, uh, speaking to people's core purpose, speaking to what, what is meaningful and impactful for them, but also being really, really specific, providing a really strong narrative. You know, I've forgotten 90% of what I learned during those four hours. The only thing I really remembered was don't go over 30 miles an hour in urban roads. That, that was it. But I think that was strong enough. Um, if I was being really uh, analytical about it, I'd say, well, did there need to be another four hours to, to, to learn that? And it probably could have been done in half an hour, but that's a, a separate issue. But in all the learning that we designed, what is the key strong point? What's the three strong narrative that we're really trying to inject? You know, and we try to do that in you know, leadership programs in, in London Business School. What's the one or two key things people must, must uh, walk away from? Second thing I really want to show is social collaboration, and I want to give a personal example here. So that's me on the left-hand side. I'm in an Apple store. Um, the guy in blue is Dave. Uh, Dave is a, an Apple uh, customer representative, um, and the lady opposite me is Jodine, who uh, currently works as a sales assistant in Topshop and is launching her new juice business. And um, this to me is really interesting, and I think Apple are geniuses in how they frame learning and create great learning social collaborative environments. Um, one of the first things to really share, and often I just I leave the confines of where I'm working, and I, I work from here for, for one or two days because I find it a great place to work. But one of the interesting things about Dave and, and any other Apple employee, when you ask them a question, they'll rarely actually give you the answer. Um, and what they'll often do is, is ask you questions back. Now, this can be quite irritating, I will be honest, but it actually can be really, really powerful in terms of getting you to think about what the answer is and therefore memorizing it. So typically, he'd respond by saying, well, what have you tried? Uh, what happens when you tried this? What do you think you should do? I, it, it's almost a counseling session. It's actually quite comical, but it's really, really valuable. Um, the other interesting thing that occurs is if, if, if it wasn't uh, Jodie and it'd be somebody else, there's a number of people who attend these sort of open training sessions, and they come from different worlds. You know, you, one day you might be opposite, opposite of Jodie, and the other day it might be a musical composer, the other day it might be um, a Tai Chi instructor. You're talking about people from a variety of, of business interests really getting together. And what I find inevitably happens is you start sharing. Uh, it starts off with, can I get you a coffee? And it ends up with actually, let me give you some ideas in terms of your website. And you have this incredible situation where people are truly collaborating who seemingly have nothing in common, but just because of the platform and the social environment that's being created, do what do work on interdependent things together. And that's incredible. Um, so one of the challenges I've really put to you is, well, what can you do within your organization to just more often ask great questions more of the time? I'm really provoked at ABLE collaborative 
learning environment. And again, all this is uh, really moving away from having the answer, but just creating the framework in which uh, people can arrive at the answers themselves. Uh, one aspect of, of, of increasingly uh, becoming common work is that of experimentation and, and a management experiments. Um, and with this, uh, one of the ways in which we do that is really think, you know, where do people want to create a real change in their, in their organization? What's the hypothesis of what could work in, in part of the organization? And then build up a team to actually make that happen. So you isolate part of the organization, you have a go at running with it with a new idea, bringing the right people on board, and you see whether or not it succeeded. And if it has succeeded, you open that up and you replicate it in other parts of, of the business. Um, but again, all of this is really about creating the context in which experimentation and collaboration can really, really occur. Now, I think moving on, a really key thing here is actually uh, the more mastery becomes important, the more it is to really help people to play to their strengths. Now, as part of the final process here, we asked you this question. We asked you, the last time that you learned a significant new skill or behavior with success, did it build upon a natural strength? Or did it involve something you previously had limited aptitude for? And again, we didn't know which way this was going to go. Perhaps you could speculate if you had many learning development people there. They were constantly interested in in learning new things and new things, things that they had previously limited aptitude for. And the result was as follows. 65%, exactly the same figure as the first uh, question actually, 65% uh, of people said when they really, really want to engage in, some, in, in a piece of learning, their preference is to build upon uh, a natural strength. And that, that's interesting, that, that figure is really, really interesting. Because if we, if we are saying as learning practitioners, HR change practitioners, that we ourselves prefer to embark on learning that plays to our strengths, to what extent are we creating learning environments and learning opportunities for people that play to their strengths? Sometimes I think we fall into the trap, and uh, some survey information that I'll share with you in a short while will back this up, but we think people have to be kind of the, the perfect well-rounded leader. I think to a certain extent that's true. I think towards the left hand side here, you look at you look at the well rounded. And I think to an extent we all have to um, address shortcomings. We have to be aware of our blind spots, we have to be aware of where we're falling short. But this theory really says that in order to be excellent, in order to thrive, in order to really, really flourish, we actually need to be leveraging our strengths much more. And how, is it, how can we do that? As a, uh, how can we do that in our world? How can we help people to discover and leverage their, their strengths? So what I'd ask you to do in that last two minutes of you know, now the webinar before we open up to questions, is really just think about now how it would feel if somebody said the following to you. To really help you get insights around your strengths. Tell me what you really enjoy. Tell me what you love to do. You know, when I saw you doing X, I saw that you loved it. Look, I don't know, really know if you're aware of it, but the feedback when you do Y is absolutely incredible. You are awesome at it. So I'm going to open this up to uh, a poll now, and I want to see you to think about the following. So to what extent do you feel supported at work in having your own strength uncovered or acknowledged. This is really where people help to point out to you what you're great at already, or at least acknowledge uh, that you do have a real strength in that area. So I'll just give you a few moments now to uh, rate your answers, and I will share uh, what those are. Okay, we'll give another. 10 seconds or so. You know, while, while we're waiting for data to come in, there's, there's so much evidence that actually demonstrates that where I feel my strengths and my natural qualities are at least acknowledged, 
my motivation to perform better increases exponentially. So the sheer act of recognizing in another person their qualities without even having to do anything after that is, is really, really powerful. So, so how often do we do that? Do we do that enough in, in our organizations? So Larry, we're still waiting on this uh, data to come through. So here we have it. So the majority of people, have, so we've got 10% of people who've given it a five, 41% of people have given it a four, 18% have given it a three, 20% have given it a two, 11% have given it one. So for the majority of the people on this call, they're really saying that, uh, yeah, actually, it's pretty strong. My, uh, my strengths are acknowledged, so that is fantastic. Question uh, number two here would be, okay, so that's about uh, revealing strengths. What about uh, strength development? So, as I go through these questions, think about your responses to, to these questions. The first are about revealing, and these are around applying. So, how can, we get, how can we get you doing that more often? How can we bring this passion of yours into work? What can I do to help you bring out these qualities even more? I can see your greater X. How could you be even better with that quality? So, obviously, this is really about opening up windows, uh, routes for people to apply these strengths. So, the pulse this, this, this time is, I will share all this with you uh, after the webinar with this data, is to what extent do you feel your organization supports its people in applying their strengths? So I want you to be as honest as you can here. This now isn't about you. It's actually about your organization. So to what extent do you feel your organization supports its people in applying their strengths? The same scale, one to a small extent, five to a very large extent. As we just wait for that data to come in, um, there was a really, really important study done um, back in 2001 by Gallup, and they surveyed 1.7 million employees in 101 companies from 63 countries. So basically, this was really valid. And uh, the question was really, um, at work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day? So at work, do you have the opportunity to do what you do best every day? And the number of people who said, yes, I do, was only 20%. And this was kind of shocking at the time. It, it spawned a lot of uh, emergent work after that uh, around sort of psychology and around strength-based development. But only 20% of people were actually saying they were um, actively engaged in, in doing at work each day what they do best. So we have the data in, and it's really interesting. <laughs> so the data says 46% of you were at number one. Um, oh, sorry, that, that, that is incorrect. I'm unable to read off a, uh, off a, a colleague's laptop here. So 20% of you said number one, 21% of you said number two, 30, 25% of you said number three, 28% number four, and 5% number five. So at this time, it's much more evenly distributed and it's not very generous. So only 33% of people rated it a, uh, a four or a five. So most people are saying actually to not a great extent. So the really, you know, and this is just so important. If, if we know empirically that actually playing to all strengths really does enable people to be excellent, what is it that we can do in our role to enable people to step up uh, and play to their strengths? So before we open to questions, Mary, I just want to thank everybody for being present, uh, taking part of this, and I really hope that it's left you with some, some insightful um, tips and techniques of how to improve learning stickiness within a context of how the world is changing. Mary, over to you. Hi Mark, thanks so much for a fascinating presentation. I really liked your quote, the essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action while reason leads to conclusions. 
I thought the Michelin Tires advert was a very poignant example of how to reinforce messaging and ensure it resonates with your audience. So thanks very much for that. Uh, we've actually had a question come through from somebody who's wondering whose quote that was. I'll be happy to share that with everybody after the uh, after presentation. Okay, fantastic. So we've got about 15 minutes or so some questions. Um, just a reminder to everyone that you can post this at the right-hand side of your screen using the chat facility, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. We've got a few come in already, so let's kick off. Okay, so Mark, Claire wants to know, what are some of the best ways to ensure there is a high level of buy-in to learning programs within your organization? Um, well, I think the key thing is purpose, really. So to what extent does, what does Claire think um, that the program will really talk to her purpose? So the, her people's purpose. So you know, the question to constantly ask yourself is, uh, what's in it for me? How does this affect me? How does this personally affect me? How will it enable me to shine? How will it enable me to play to my strengths? You know, and then if it doesn't really answer that, that question, then I guess it's tough. Um, the other thought that, that really springs to mind is actually co-creation. So uh, a really great way to ensure buying is actually to not regard ourselves as separate, obviously, to the business in terms of having that learning expertise, but actually, you know, together with, you know, with the business, how can we both create uh, a really great learning intervention that will be fantastic? Because obviously, if you've been uh, involved in its creation, you'll be naturally much more bought into it to the solution. Okay, great. Um, another question coming from Sandy. There's more legislative and regulatory oversight of many businesses, which can lead to a culture of control and compliance. How does a heterogogic approach to learning help in this environment? Well, I think there's, um, I think people are basically asking themselves, so what? You know, people, you know, there are certainly, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about, there are certain legislative requirements that say you have to go on, on this sort of program or be aware of this, but that doesn't preclude um, us from being able to go a step further and say, what does this, what does this really mean to me? Um, you know, I, I recently worked in a quite a, a dangerous environment with a, a, a mining organization, uh, and people have died in the past but from this mining. Um, and what the company was fantastic at was, was providing the why. So we don't always have to go to an incredibly experiential approach, but we do have to very, be able to justify and make clear and visceral using emotion why is we're asking people to do these things. And they were just really honest. They said, look, in the last amount of years, X number of people have died. This is the end application. And they use very clever techniques, but do you want this on your conscience? conscience, conscience? Um, so I think making, making whatever it is that is compli a compliant requirement come to life viscerally for the individual that speaks to their sense of, of purpose and rationale is, is, is probably the way to go. Okay, super. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions coming in around the area of strength, Mark. Um, mm -hmm. Another question come in from Claudine who said, in a highly regulated business, often the focus of development discussions is on the gap, especially in, terms, in times of austerity or change where there can be often increased focus on doing more with less. How do you think we can encourage managers and employees to focus on, on and develop strength? Um. Well, I would, to be honest with you, I would, I would recommend sharing some good data with them, uh, especially in that sort of a tightly controlled organization where probably a logical argument is quite structured, arguments are quite well received. I would just provide some information, and I would just provide that kind of Gallup information. There's loads more on the Gallup website. That basically says when people are playing to their strengths, they just are much more productive. And, and that, you know, you can argue that either way, but it is backed up by a lot of empirical data. I mean, the other thing to really point out is, I think most people would accept that, that, that there is, and especially in both Claudine's organization, a large part of just, just having to get on and do what's required. So I, I'd argue there's always room for people to really shine against their key strengths. You know, and it might be that the person walks away with, with, with a number of actions they don't necessarily necessarily adore, 
there's just one or two where they feel, you know what, Claudine, she really got me. She got what I'm into. She got what my core strength was. And she, she really helped me work out just one or two key things that I can do against them. Then, then, then it's got to be helpful. Okay, great. Um, Alan's coming at this at another angle, Mark. So he's saying, do you think there is maybe a danger of spending too much time on strength to the disadvantage of some other areas that might need development? Well, Alan, I mean, the thing is, I mean, if you go back to the slide where I showed that, that arrow, um, so the point was, and I didn't make it, I think, well, I probably obviously didn't make it very strongly, but I'll try again, that clearly we have, we have to produce leaders who are, are well-rounded, that, uh, you know, we have to have a certain basic minimum against the key requirements for, for individual jobs. And that's, I'm not arguing against that. Um, and that's really, really important. But for people to go to the next level, to really, really be excellent and to provide excellence for their organizations, more often than not, if you look at the studies, look at the examples, look at the testimonials from, from really successful leaders, they've managed to find their niche that's aligned to a really core cool area of strength that they have. So we're not saying don't be well-rounded, don't, don't enable people to understand what their blind spots are. That's really important. And not doing that can be really dangerous. But when it comes to excellence, it's leveraging the strength that, that's really, really important. OK. And Jane, is, Jane wants to know, she's saying, Marcus Buckingham's book, Now Discover Your Strengths, back in 2005, focused on being better at what you're good at. She's asking, are there any more modern tools that you can recommend to identify people's key strengths? Um, strength, strength Finder online. Um, there's the Reflective Best Self exercise, but that, that's kind of gone. And I think London Business School itself is developing uh, one self tools, and there'll probably be more, much more information about that in the future. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a pragmatist, really, when it comes down to it, Jane. So, um, more often than not, it's actually about having good conversations. It's just about it's just, it's just about asking yourself what your strengths are. You know, think back to stories, time in your past where you did things really well and you really enjoyed them, um, and just ask other people's opinions. You know, so guys, I'm just thinking about my strengths. When, when you think of when I've been really good, really strong at something, what is it I've been done? I, I recently did this, did this uh, with a bunch of my uh, ex colleagues and family and friends as part of an exercise here, and it, it was incredible just uh, hearing stories of, we don't actually often ask people this, to just give us stories of where we've been at our, at our best, um, but it, it just gave me great data, and you, you can do that just by having conversations. Okay. Aside from conversations, um, Nui is asking, what do you think the role of technology, social networks, for example, is uh, within learning and development? So is that Louis, Mary? Yeah. Um, well, it's my, I mean, it's, it's, it's enormous. I mean, and, and hopefully what I've tried to convey with, with everything that I've talked about today is, is as relevant uh, online as it, is, as it is offline. So everything I've talked about in terms of asking, you know, the whole, point, the whole section where I talked about asking great questions, that's such an important part of actually um, technology. Now, when you come to social media, actually being able to frame really intelligent questions for people to answer is such a skill in and of itself. Um, so it's massive, it's huge. OK. Um, Alison has, has come through with another question. Sometimes we need to launch learning or change initiatives for organizational reasons. What steps can we take to help employees see this as meeting their individual learning needs, or should we even try to do that? That is a brilliant question, Alison. Um, well, I think, look, if you're the person leading the change, Alison, it's, uh, you, you need to ask yourself, how much do you buy into that change? That, that is question number one. So this organizational change that I'm uh, responsible for implementing, to what extent am I personally, and you can't answer it for yourself, to what am I personally brought into it? Now, if you are, you can tell your own personal story in terms of why you believe that it's really important for the organization. And that might not be the same as what's in it for the individuals, because 
because they may need some convincing as to why the purpose, the more strategic, really core business reason uh, behind this. You know, the old example of actually losing some jobs in order to safeguard the, the safety of the organization is, is a classic example. Um, but it does help tremendously if you can align it to the individual's needs and to one's own needs. Uh, but, but look, we don't, even, we don't live in a perfect world, so I'm, I do recognize that at certain times you just, you just won't be able to do that. It's just, it's, it's just a case of doing it. Okay, great. And we're vastly running out of time, Mark. We're having loads of questions flowing in, which is fantastic. And I can see everybody that Mark put his contact details um, on the slide there. So if you do have any follow-up questions, I'm sure he wouldn't mind you posing them to him directly. Um, I'd just like to finish up with one last question from Yvonne, who says, we have a small team of L&D consultants that have been operating in the UK. We've recently acquired another organization, and now we have to deploy L&D assets globally using a blended learning approach. How can we do this and really make the learning stick? Well, Yvonne, thank you for asking a humongously massive final question. Um, <laughs> Just throw that in there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, Yvonne, if you want to contact me after that, that is really not that cool. Um, but, you know, I'd, I'd be asking you all sorts of questions. I'd be asking, well, actually, um, what, what the, you know, where are they trying to get to as an organization? What are some of the global imperatives? Um, and I'd be sort of also dividing it between uh, knowledge and mindset and beliefs. You know, so you know, knowledge—that's you know, knowledge, uh, great. Deliver it, deliver it online. Deliver it up front. Mindset and beliefs. You, you're probably more talking about in person and, and sorry, Yvonne, doing lots of global trips and doing lots of face-to-face -face or, or empowering others to do that. But um, it, it, it's, a, it's a big question, Yvonne. But if you want to contact me, I'd be happy to uh, share some thoughts with you. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Well, thanks everybody for your questions, and really sorry that we didn't get through everything today. Um, a lot of people, Mark, were actually asking around the whole global piece, so you know about global trends and what cultural differences you might need to take into account when deploying learning. So we better wrap up now because we're vastly approaching uh, three o'clock. So just a reminder that we'll be sending the recorded version of the webinar out in the next few days. So please do look out for that. Once again, thank you all for taking the time to join us today, to Mark and to London Business School. And as Mark mentioned, if you do have any questions, please do contact him directly. Or if you have any feedback on the webinar you've heard today, please do drop me a line. Okay, that concludes the session today, and we look forward to seeing you on another Change Board webinar very soon. Have a very good afternoon. <laughs>